Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, it was pretty. Yeah. Okay, Call the Cascade Charter Township Planning Commission to order for Monday, October 17th, 2022. I'll record the attendance that uh, Member Moxley and Member Corsonage are both excused. Uh, moving on to Article 2, the Pledge of Allegiance, if everybody could please stand. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Moving to Article 3, do I hear an approval of the current agenda? So moved. Support. Support. Moved by Member Rissi, supported. Who did I hear it from? Member Rappin. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Hearing none opposed, we'll move on. Article 4, can I uh, approve the minutes? Does anybody approve the minutes from October 3rd? I'll approve the minutes. Okay. Mount motion made by Marissi. I hear support. Support. Support from Member Rapp and all those in favor say aye. 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 Just okay. note that I'll abstain yes. from voting. Okay. As, as did I. Okay. So Member Engel and uh, Member Deering have abstained. Moving on to Article 5, disclose a conf any conflicts of interest. Does anybody wish to disclose a conflict of interest that relates to? The matters that are in front of the planning commission tonight. Can I uh, ask a question about conflict here? Yeah. So I know many of us abstain from the approval of the minutes sometimes, but if we're absent and we watch the meeting on Zoom, so we've seen an account of what happens, we could still then participate in the approval of the minutes, could we not? I don't see why we couldn't. I would believe so. Yep. Yeah. I think, I think you could. Yeah. I think you could participate in that. But is I'm just curious what the what the is attendance by Zoom what? considered attendance? It's not considered attendance. It's not considered attendance. I'm not sure how we could then approve the minutes at a meeting we did not officially attend. Are we not approving the minutes for accuracy? But if you weren't officially present, I think the point is you can't gauge the accuracy. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That's my two cents. Okay. Do we right. want? Uh, do you want me to do? Do you want me to ask the the lawyer, Scott? Uh, it's I could. unnecessary. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. I'll do that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good question. We'll get a parliamentarian one of these days. Okay. Does anybody else wish to disclose any conflicts of interest? Hearing none. Uh, we'll move on to Article 6. Acknowledge any visitors who are wishing to speak. Uh, if you're here to speak about Article 7 or Article 8, I would ask that you wait until we cover those particular topics. But if there's somebody that wishes to speak, and Maddie, do we have anybody on Zoom? Okay. All right, let's move on then to Article 7, discussion of the future land use of the designated southeast of the airport. Um, so before we, the intent uh, of tonight is to hear from residents, right? Um, we sent out a letter about this hearing to all residents that were affected by this. Um, and, you know, I'm going to have Scott in a moment uh, talk about um, you know, specifically what our subcommittee has been working on on this and specific land use. And then also um, the supervisor, uh, Supervisor Les Prince agreed to be here. And I asked that she could relay some information on what we are hearing uh, from the strategic planning, uh, from, you know, various things that we have done uh, from the citizens, with, which is what's driven these questions. Should we reconsider or, you know, change the future use uh, of this land? Uh, the intention of tonight is not to make any decisions, uh, but is to hear from our residents. Uh, we've received uh, a letter that uh, at some point I'll read into the record, um, but we'd like to hear from our residents and, and that is the intent. So I'm gonna turn it over to Member Rissi who has chaired the subcommittee around this and then we'll uh, ask the supervisor to present. Thank you, Chairman Rodick. Uh, so, I'd like to give everybody just a, a, a quick little bit of background here, and I'm hoping that Member Rappin can help me with this a little bit since the other members of the subcommittee are absent tonight. But uh, so if I get off the rails, just guide me here. Uh, so if you go back uh, several months, there was some land on Thornap River Drive across from the FedEx facility, we'll say, uh, that's part of the airport. And an applicant came and wanted to build a temporary structure on that property that was, I think, around 1,000 feet long. And it was kind of like a, a, a tent or a hoop house, if you will. Uh, 
and the, the nature of construction. And so the, the planning commission uh, was faced with the, um, well, we had the reality that the airport was was certainly looking to find people to lease property in the area. And at the time that the airport's zoning was created, the current zoning that we use there about 20 years ago, the airport was not in the business of leasing its property to other developers. And so we thought maybe we need to take a, a, a fresh look at the current zoning of the airport. And in the process of starting to dive into that and dissect it and look at it and look at the other uses that are approved there, um, we started looking at the land surrounding the airport that if the airport expanded, it might move towards or other development might gravitate towards the airport. And that kind of opened the door to discuss this area. This area has been uh, future land use or master planned as an industrial area for uh, a number of years, is my understanding. And, uh, and so we, we thought before we start talking about the airport zoning, we really needed to have a better understanding of what our long-term plan is for the areas surrounding the airport. And then that's when we kind of got into the discussion of inviting everybody in. So we just wanted to hear what everybody's thoughts were on this area, what they'd like to see happen, what the timeline of what they'd like to see happen is. Do people want to see things change right away? Maybe they don't want to see them change ever. Maybe they want to see them change in 30 years. I mean, we just like to have some some input as we try to review what's currently out there. That, that, yes, Sums that's helpful. Up. So I think next uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Supervisor Les Prince to uh, provide feedback on the Strategic uh, Planning Committee. And then Brian, I'll put you on bat to just talk about the, the current land use and, and maybe give some definition. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Is it weird being on this side? I was just side? gonna say it's been a while before yeah. be, since being a, Local resident. Yeah. Thank you. This is an overdue visit. The Planning Commission has worked so hard the past two years. It's an unthankful job, or people don't realize how much work goes into it. But just know that as the supervisor, and I think I can speak on behalf of the board, you guys have done fantastic work. And it's just a pleasure to know that. Well, I personally take pride because some of you helped give it just fantastic Planning Commission work. So we really appreciate it. The township needs it. And it's just a pleasure to work with you guys. Not even work with you. You guys are um, largely self-contained in a good way. Um, so the strategic plan took about a year. Um, we went much deeper dive, I think, than it, it. The process took longer than what we had hoped, but we mailed. But we wanted a, a firm foundation that really represented what the community overall saw for problems pros, cons, and what they saw as the future of Cascade or what they would want. Um, we, we received the, we mailed um, surveys to every residence. We got almost 2000 back. We had um, four focus group meetings that were based on the, the, the main issues that we heard about that so the township can do something about. For example, public safety. We already contract out to the sheriff's department. That's not on the township that's not something directly that we can control. Um, but what overwhelmingly came back was the desire of residents to maintain the quaint character of Cascade, preserve green space long-term with the acknowledgement that growth, growth is inevitable, but making sure that it's smart growth that's based on what's best for Cascade in general, specifically its residents. That was overwhelmingly um, the preservation of Cascade as a residential community. Um, was just up there along with public safety, maintaining a safe community and um, a bit more walkable village area. So the Downtown Development Authority can handle the village area, hopefully with some um, cooperation from the Planning Commission. Uh, but the Planning Commission, you guys, and with our planner, it brings up zoning. So um, I realize that's probably all that you have to that you need to know. But the ADA, ADA's um, strategic planning process, I was speaking to the, the manager a couple of weeks ago for their trails and their downtown area. That was based on, they had 300 responses 
approximately to their survey. And they had two specific meetings, focus groups. So at first I was thinking 2000 is okay, it's not great, but it's by far the most that McKenna, our, our firm has gotten back. It's the best feedback they've got. And 2000 versus 300 over an ADA, that was, I was kind of happy with that. So anyways, if you have any questions about what, you know, from the board's perspective or the strategic plan, um, I'd love to try to answer them. In full disclosure, I serve on this committee as well, um, and Wendy does as, as well, uh, or will be serving on the next uh, step of it. I, I asked the supervisor, so you weren't hearing from me. We, we had somebody that was presenting on it. So, but in the future, I can certainly answer questions when the supervisor is not here. Um, and specifically, I mean, it, what what I heard, and I th just to reaffirm what, what I heard from you is they, they're looking for us to maintain residential areas uh, over light industrial. Yes, and our numbers from the previous strategic plan or parks plan, they what we estimated, what the firm estimated, um, you know, by 2020 we'd have 20,000 residents. Whatever was estimated, we surpassed that growth. So we are we were at a higher rate of growth than what was anticipated in the prior planning documents. Um, I don't know what had. I don't know what had changed how the zoning became to be that way in the past. Um, but I will say that we have a much more proactive resident oriented planning commission and I would say staff leadership in general. So. Awesome, does anybody have any questions for the supervisor? Yeah, so with regard to the focus groups, approximately how many people per focus group would you say showed up? They were in this room and anyone else who was who were members can feel free to guess we at least 60 yeah, I we think more than that. 60 per, oh, yeah. per, per group yeah we yeah. were filling up the room it was wow. and that wasn't virtual not as many attended virtually that that's in addition to we hear things at the board you guys probably do too but residents aren't shy about complaining or what they wanted and <laughs> i haven't heard anybody that says um that that was pro let's develop it up that being said i know there's always a tension and um we certainly don't want to short residents um in other areas at all and there's things that we can look at at the township level but this this plot of land did come up and the general consensus was there was a lot of land that has not been developed south of the airport mm -hmm. um and, and that was a lot of the feedback that we got like specifically around light industrial that hey, why are we wanting, you know, why, and, and it's kind of what precipitated this a little bit was why do we want to uh, future use light industrial when we have already light industrial that's not filling up. Um, so that, that was one of the things that came back. Is it kind of a free flowing conversation? I mean, we, they weren't like led to, we didn't know to lead them. Okay. We, we didn't. They, no, just they, said, they, had, okay. yeah. they had everybody in groups at, at tables mm -hmm. and then we all uh, like there'd be eight or nine people at a table okay. and they'd make a list of like seven or eight talking or uh, thoughts of what they what they wanted to see in, in an order and then at the end McKenna would collect all that and then report back on you know oh well and it really nine out was of ten tables said they want this yeah so. that's what I was yeah. asking and if they were led yeah. to those conclusions or if they came up with them on their own yeah no. And it really was led by resident driven because <clears throat> after once the the worms what's the saying the, the something the cats loop. out of the bag or whatever yeah it was hard you I can't rein it back in so even I was kind of like you know it was what the residents wanted um mm -hmm. yeah and the other issue is water and I don't quite understand the zoning given that with the with the township having to address the PFAS issue um that has is still unresolved fully and then the fact that development any, I mean, that's just common sense, proactive steps. You got to have sewer and water if you're going to develop an area. And I know that there had been a request. I mean, I don't, there's no justification for residents to foot the bill so that the, you know, so that developers can make a profit. I think that's no way. So I just think it's a little bit cart before the horse because until that sewer and water, I mean, if they want to pay for that, then we'll look at it. But until then, we serve residents. We don't serve businesses or, or people who are looking to make a profit in Cascade. And we certainly want to be fair, but we also want to be proactive in preserving what makes Cascade a great place to live. And I think being reactive as we have in the past has led us to some situations where 
I, I think we've been extremely generous or maybe passive in certain areas where I, I don't think if we want to, if we want to follow what the residents want overwhelmingly in the strategic plan, it requires being proactive, working with residents who are negatively affected, but being proactive. And there's not much, I mean, Cascade is rapidly developing, so we kind of have to preserve what we have. In, in this supervisor's opinion, which is consistent with the overwhelming response that we received from residents. More than what you wanted. Thank you. Any, no. any other questions for the supervisor? All right, well, thank, thank you. you so and much. thanks for the invitation. I, I, I should have been here a year ago because you guys have just been killing it for that amount of time. And um, I hope that you know that at least from the board, we see your hard work and we really appreciate it. We need it, frankly. So thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Brian, would you like to come up and just do um, a, a quick review of the, the current zoning map and maybe explain potential uses for each area? Yeah, or I can do it here too. I've got some of that in front sure. of me. So the current zoning of that area is agricultural and it's it's been that way, which allows for single family homes, agricultural uses as, few, as well as a few other special use ones there as well. And that's pretty much all of the area southeast of the airport onto the river um, is uh, zoned agricultural. And then the map on the screen there is the future land use map, which comes out of the master plan. And the future land use zone for that area between M6 and the airport is industrial. And it has been that way in the past few um, master plans. I found the 2009 and 1999 master plans in those future land use areas that is industrial as well, with the idea that utilities are required here. So if utilities were brought to a property, then it could be rezoned to industrial is how that kind of future land use designation would be used. Does anybody have any questions of Brian? Uh, I might. I, um, I don't know if I should bring this up now or later. I, I was, uh, I was doing a little uh, evening reading just, you know, cause I was bored. So I thought I'd read our zoning ordinance and uh, I noticed in the, and I, I'm not saying that our map is drawn incorrectly, but I noticed in, I believe the transitional industrial zoning definition, mm -hmm. it specifically states, I think uh, south of 48th street and uh, west of M6 as transitional industrial. And the map shows it as industrial. And the future land use map? Yes. It only has one industrial designation. So that so could the go future land way. use map doesn't show a different shade for transitional industrial? It does not. No, it would it could be, I would imagine, either one. It just has the one industrial designation. Okay. So the 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 map on screen right now, mm -hmm. that's the future land use map? Correct. So when I look along craft there at the darker shaded area, what's that? That is the traditional or transitional mixed use is what that purple okay. color is. All right. So that's mixed use and then the other part's industrial. Okay. Understood. Thank you for the clarification on that. Anybody else have any questions for Brian? All right, thank you, Brian. So uh, before I ask for input from the audience, I would like to read into the record an email that we received on Friday. It was addressed to a member of staff um, I want, and this came from Tyler Essenberg. Uh, I wanted to share, <clears throat> to share voice on potential future zoning use of property off Thornample Drive by airport. Hope the property can stay the same houses and farmland. Heard the airport developers want uh, more done. Do we really need it? I'm off 48th street, right across from Thornample Point. Have plenty of noise and other pollution as it is. PFAS is enough of a concern. Would be grateful to keep light industrial as far as possible from homeowners. Thank you for taking the time to read my note. Appreciate the work you do, Tyler Essingberg. So that's in the record. Um, what I'd like to do now is ask for input from those that are in the audience and wishing to speak and anybody that is on Zoom. Manny, do we have people on Zoom? All right, so it's just in the audience tonight. Um, my ask is that we limit it to, to five minutes per presenter. Uh, and I'd also ask you, uh, you for your name and address, but um, we put some aerial maps on the table, which are projected up there. If 
if you'd be so kind as to point us to where your property is, it'd, it'd be helpful for us to understand as we look at, you know, who's here. So um, I'll open it up and uh, I'll let you know when you're getting close to five minutes. So don't all rush to the microphone at once. <laughs> Good evening. Greg Ball with Visser Development. I represent DEG Development. We own the piece of property right here, uh, about 77 acres. Um, so a few questions. I mean, we're raised, listen to um, the young lady here. Sorry, Super, supervisor last Prince. Um, anyway, so I mean, that's great that there's a survey put out, but I mean, how specific was the survey? Was it specifically about this property? Was it development in general? They understand the ramifications of what taxes can be brought in with industrial. I mean, I'd love to see that survey if you've got it. Um, be, I think all of us would probably like to see that. It'd been great if we were notified about those meetings too. So first off, I mean, every property that abuts the airport currently, besides the property we're talking about is either industrial or transitional airport already. So it seems like there's more than enough precedent for this property, this area of properties to stay future land use um, industrial. Our property loan is 76 acres. We've have drawings probably would put, um, you know, roughly seven buildings on it, maybe anywhere from one to seven buildings at some point when we get the water and sewer there. But the, the point of this is that we're looking at probably $30 million in taxable value just in our development, which gets about 1.5 million per year in um, real property taxes. This whole area we're talking about is about 255 acres. That's, if you extrapolate those numbers, that's four and a half million dollars in revenue, tax revenue. Do the, I mean, I don't know, maybe the citizens would rather pay higher taxes themselves or would they rather have a little development by an airport, which is certainly not ideal for residential. I mean, I don't know who is begging to be by an international airport. Um, I certainly don't know anybody. Um, what else did I say? And then, um, you know, in terms of the water and sewer, I don't, I mean, I don't think anybody's saying the residents themselves have to pay for the water and sewer. We're open to participating. Typically municipalities we work in, it's a deferred assessment. Otherwise you have the developers paid up front and as people hook up to it, they pay back into the pot and reimburse whoever paid for it. So um, certainly we would not expect only the residents to pay for water and sewer. Obviously, if a developer is developing buildings for industrial use, those industrial users have to pay for the water and sewer. So um, that's a huge issue. We need to get the water and sewer over there, but it certainly wouldn't be all put on cascades um, on the township or the resident's plate to pay for. Um, you know, we've got the right place. Tim Mraz from the right place wanted to be here, but he's out of town, um, fully supportive of trying to get grants and stuff from both the state and federal levels for water and sewer. Typically that happens if you can get some tenants or users locked in first because it's all based on jobs. But um, we do that in other municipalities all the time. So there's a huge need for industrial property. I don't know exactly where south of the airport you're talking about where there's industrial property. There is zero to be developed south of the airport that's for sale. So, you know, I know Adonako owns a ton of property. He wants, he's a billion dollars is what he wants for it, if you'd have called and asked him. So, I mean, that's unrealistic. He doesn't want it developed because he wants to save it for his own business. There's two properties in all of Kent County, over 20 acres for sale right now that are zone industrial. One just hit the market a month ago in Cedar Springs, and one's in Walker that was under contract and the buyer bailed because it's partly zoned residential and partly zoned industrial. So, there's a huge need for industrial property, industrial. The segment of industrial market for commercial property is off the hook. I mean, it's been the best segment for the last five years. We had 128 acre development in Walker right off from 96. We thought it'd take us 10 years to develop. We got it done in three years. So, and Walker's enjoying a huge amount of tax income from those properties. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Doug Todd from Berkshire Hathaway Commercial Real Estate. And I represent Jada Development, which is owns 10 acres right on 52nd Street, kind of right across from uh, Greg's property with Visser Development. And my history of that property, I represented the Runhog family that had the 76 acres and we marketed it for about three years 
uh, very patiently knowing, you know, it was master planned industrial. As we marketed that property, I mean, I was shocked, not really shocked, but it was interesting to learn the site selection companies from around the country that are searching and the amount of quality operators that were interested in that site. And then even through the zoning process, I mean, when you look at it and work in communities and zoning, I mean, obviously I live in Rockford. I mean, we have exact same discussions about the residents and our living and quality of life and all those kinds of things. But if you look in an area and Grand Rapids is the second largest city in the state of Michigan and the airport's the second busiest airport in the state of Michigan, Traverse City oddly happens to be the third, I believe. But you're bordered with significant hard borders, you know, hard borders of industrial users of the airport, hard borders of M6, a significant expressway system. So if you look at a strategic area for an ideal spot for industrial, it's there. And also too, when you talk to the residents, I mean, sometimes their perception of an industrial is much different than what it could be. You know, a lot of, I don't wanna speak for Greg, but a lot of the calls that come in and a lot of the work that we're doing is kind of that last mile distribution. And we are beyond an epic need for those elements. And so it's, you know, what does the community want and what does the community need and it's transitional type uses. And there couldn't really be a more ideal area for a transitional type use. And those transitional type uses are going from single family homes of that two to two and a half acre density element going kind of to those heavier industrial uses and those logical ones of those transitional use are heavy commercial. You know, that's not a retail corridor. You know, it could be uh, high density residential, which is badly needed. But I mean, all the vision and the discussions of what you've had from your focus groups are kind of where we're at today with the crisis in housing and where do we put this stuff? And it's kind of forcing our community to go farther and farther out. And the other reason why this is so ideally suited is if you kind of look at, you know, close access to the expressway, all season roads, those are all the check boxes that we're looking for. In other words, we go put in this rural area and these trucks and trailers are traveling extreme distances to get it to their end, end, end destination. And you, know, you look at the overall impact of that and master planning, it's just nuts. Um, I've had the unique opportunity for several clients to travel to some pretty significant areas. Today, I flew back from, uh, Columbus, Ohio, you know, and New Albany and where they're putting the, uh, the Intel chip plant and to see what that community's done to, to weave residential development and commercial development and what they put in the infrastructure. I applaud those folks because they were, you know, very forward thinking in their planning and elements. They would be starving for a site like this to be able to go do that. You know, and then when you say there's other industrial development sites, there aren't. I mean, Greg and I work in the market every day I mean, we've got this parcel. I represent Jado in this parcel, you know, for that for that use and need down the road. So, you know, kind of to check that box, I mean, it's a, just an ideally suited transitional zoning area. I mean, the calls and the inquiries that come in in that are are significant. And the other part that we're seeing in this country, and I'm and I was just working on a project up near Flint, Michigan, with Grand Blank Township, another very similar township to what. Cascade would be, and they have a tech village that we'll be closing on here in a couple of weeks, but I went to go visit in that process two potential user. One potential user was a robotics company, um, you know, obviously making robotics for the EV industry and even dumbing it down. They were working on a robotics for a fence manufacturer, oddly, but I mean, they listened to what their needs are and where they would need to go is, and the, and where their business model is for growth, they're just like at a huge glass ceiling. It's not a glass ceiling that they just hit or they're anticipating some growth, but they are just banging their head against this black glass ceiling. You know, right after that, I went to go visit another manufacturer that makes inspection equipment that inspects parts, auto parts. They actually even inspect ammunition and they're making these inspection machines going across the country. This is stuff that's in Michigan. And so these, these suppliers are out there like you can't believe. I'm on the board of directors for Seaboard. I interrupt, but we're, we're coming up on okay. five minutes. So, But the point I'm trying to make is the need is massive. And if you were to look all over the state of Michigan that you would just kind of say, hey, Lex, what's the first type, top five spots for a industrial area? You know, this isn't heavy industrial manufacturing. Most of this is warehousing and distribution is really what it is. But this would be like probably one of the 
top one or two sites is you, hey, that's like a logical one. Let's put that there and let's start working around it. So, so I would really welcome and, you know, the work that Visser does. I mean, these are very thoughtful processes. I mean, we're not just trying to come in with that big buck. I mean, we're trying to network in the communities and drive times and jobs. And I mean, the things that are going on behind the scenes, it's just pretty epic and pretty, pretty exciting to see what, what we're seeing in positive activity and positive development. So we welcome the opportunity to stay there as an investor and do some quality projects at that, pros at that property. We welcome the opportunity to network with Visser Development and, and, I, and we've had conversations and spent quite a bit of money designing some infrastructure and landscaping and design and curb appeal. All that stuff is like in the top elements of those discussions. So it's either just low end, ram it, jam it, get it to happen. I mean, even employers want to see nice quality projects because they've seen for recruiting and retention, you know, the trails and all that other stuff is just really important. So there's a way bigger picture going on here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As far as a tax base, there's a common perception that, industri that the industrial areas around the airport or closer to um, towards the direction of the city bring in are, are really the base, the tax base for the township, and that is not true. The over we have a fantastic tax base that most communities would absolutely die to have. Wonderful resources available for in, in Cascade Township. And where that comes from, the majority, the, the way majority is residential properties. We are, we are a wealthy community based on our residential property taxes, not commercial. So we can get that information to the planning commission, but I just wanted to clear up that misconception because that is not, that is not um, what makes this township wealthy. And I would just say, this is classic growing pains. I don't, we, we can work with other developers, but this is classic. If developers, if, you know, real estate and, and outside developers, we don't act for what's best for the area. Our job is to represent residents and the residents live here because they want to, and they want to maintain Cascade as a quaint place to be. That may require buffers, but if you just let developers and real estate agents run the show, we lose the Cascade that the reason people live here. That also protects property values long-term and property values of residential housing is what, what is our bread and butter at the township. So here it is from your supervisor. And again, I just want to reiterate the strategic plan, the residents were crystal clear, so. Thank you. Before you walk away, Supervisor Last Prince, would you mind moving that piece of paper ever so slightly other way? Oh, sorry. Up. Not as easy as it looks, is it? Oh, I'm really? sorry. You got to go on and get some little teeth marks on that. You know what I mean? Of your supervisor. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you really want it's like laparoscopic surgery. Oh, there we go. There you can stop Thank right you. there. That's good enough. All right. Okay. You got it close. So thanks for putting in the time, but. I just, I just want to hesitate. The lure of development and money is what we, it, that's what everyone jumps at, but we are in a fortunate position to be very thoughtful about our, 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 our decisions moving forward. So from a board perspective, you're not looking to this planning commission to establish additional tax bases. No, the additional, we stay wealthy by maintaining our residential property values. That's just, it's how it is. We don't need, we're great. We are fortunate. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? We'd love to hear from you. Right, let me see if somebody else. Yes, thank you. I'll try. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. Oh, that oh, was really yeah. easy. Oh, you want a job? You must have been studying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not dimensionally challenged, so I got this kind of figured out. <laughs> so um, I'm part of a family that owns some property here on 52nd Street. And so uh, we've owned that for a few years. And um, I don't feel like I've got a big... Uh, what, what was your name just for the record? I'm sorry, Marty Hillbrands. Thank you, Marty. Um, so we've owned that property there for a while. Um, I don't feel like we've got a big uh, issue here one way or the other. We're enjoying our property as it currently is. There's some hope for some future development that we might profit from, and that's great. But either way, I don't feel like that's a big deal to us. Um, I do think that 
Um, there has been a fair amount of thought put into this current plan. I mean, this is a perfect area for industrial development. It's totally isolated by an airport and a highway. And it's like there's literally five residences that are affected here. It's like Dan and Max and three people who live on, on you know, Thornapple River Drive. There's very few residences that are impacted by this. This is the perfect location for industrial development. Um, my other hat that I wear is in the manufacturing world. I work right on the northwest corner of the airport company off in Patterson, and um, we're looking for space as well. I mean, I totally agree with the comments that were made about industrial development space. It's like we're a manufacturing business. We're looking for space, quality space. It's difficult to find. It's like this is a great location for that kind of thing. And I don't think people are looking for development that's you know industrial forging operations or chemical plating operations they're looking for robotic assembly uh, you know places we build machinery it's assembly it's all clean manufacturing by quality companies that want good looking places in a great location and quality of life in, in a community part of it is based on jobs you got to have manufacturing jobs and, you know, I don't want to get too political about what's going on in the world these days, but it's like we need to bring more manufacturing jobs back. And if our community can sell that, I think that's a huge benefit. And um, this is a great location to do that kind of development. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Max and Dan. Nothing. No opinions. No thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. Make one comment on Hope Cascade. Been there 53 years. What should we do? My age, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Your son wants to take over my property when I'm gone. So he wants to live there and do it. Okay. I guess a little bit of concern with me would be taxes. I mean, if it goes to industrial, I think the taxes go up. Um, Jim, yeah. I, just for the record, I, I don't have the pleasure of knowing these two gentlemen. I would like to have their names and addresses on the record if we could do that. Would, would, would you mind them. just pointing to? Where, where your home, it would be helpful for us in our minutes. Yeah, the the names and the addresses. So we both live on 52nd Street. Yep. And he's, again, right there. So we, we record this, and this is how they record the minutes. So I'm going to transcribe what you're saying. So we record this, and this is how they record the minutes. So I'm going to transcribe what you're saying. So what was your name? Max Smith. Max Smith. And what was your son's name? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, that maybe not your son. What? My brother, Dan Hildebrand. I'm the, yeah. uh, Dan Hildebrand. I live at the very end of 52nd. Live, both live on 52nd Street. Yep, yep. I, I'm all the way to Thornhound River Drive, so I got the whole corner of Thornhound River Drive and 52nd Street on the south side of 52nd. This is on the north side of 52nd. Okay. 53 years. 50, 53 years south side of 52nd. So I'm just trying to, so that when the person takes minutes, they get the information. They can't, they won't be able to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, member from Visser, did you say you wanted to speak yes, again? Can you tell me when the survey? Could, can, can you wait yeah, till you, I, I want to make sure I get the minutes. Thank you. Can you tell me when the survey went out, when those discussions were oh taking gosh. place? It, it went out maybe a, a year ago. And it, yeah, we, okay. we published this. It was the strategic so, uh, planning. Okay. So, yeah. so, all right. So, we've owned the property how long? Here? Yeah. So, we had discussions with Steve Peterson, um, Ben, everyone. I don't know, everyone, three people high up in the township. Never once was this even brought up that it was a possibility before we purchased the property. So, A, that's a huge concern for me. When was Second, that, sir? when we purchased the property? No, no, the discussions. Oh, we've got emails. No, Doug's got emails from probably three years ago. I've got emails from before we bought the property. Yes. I'd be happy to share them with you. Yeah, that's, I'll be happy to forward them to you. We just started talking about this, mm -hmm. though, in the last, what, few months? Yeah, so this this is a relatively new development. I know that uh, Ben, I talked to Ben ahead of this, and okay. um, he shared with me, he had conversations with the developers, didn't mention you by name, and that there was a, a rather mm -hmm. large cost to get the water and sewer out, and that was where it was left, that, like, that, that wasn't on the plate, so it wasn't something that was going to happen. So at least that's what was relayed to me. 
Okay. Um, well, yeah, we can, yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. But I guess in terms of the tax, I don't think I ever said one industrial property is going to pay for all that be the majority tax um, revenue contributor in the, in the township. I didn't say that. But what I did say is in, a, in an industrial zone property, you don't get homestead exemptions, right? So the tax percentage is more in industrial than it is in residential. Lastly, this has been future zone master plan, whatever you want to say for how long, right? Year. I looked at 1999. As the township's as thriving. Everyone's known that who cares knows what this is a master plan. Nobody's going to be shocked that that at some point was supposed to be industrial next to an airport. I would be shocked if somebody was shocked that they didn't think that something right next to the airport wasn't someday going to get developed. I mean, I just think that's ludicrous to think that it wouldn't be that way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Two minutes reasonable. Yeah. All right. No, I just some Doug Todd Berkshire Hathaway commercial real estate, just kind of the background too, to build on what Greg says. I mean, we had long discussions, not only between the township, and Steve Pruderman, but we were at the airport. I mean, we had your engineer, we had the airport engineer. There was a lot of discussion of getting water and sewer into this area. So the, a lot of the, lot of the shareholders took a long time, but all got around the table. We had at least two meetings, if not three significant meetings, you know, located at the airport, including the township on this discussion. Uh, Supervisor Les Prince, did you have a question? Yes. Give me more, please give us more details about the background. Our engineer, Steve Peterson, the Air Force engineer. Yep. Yep. Who was the Air Force? Yeah, the whole Airport Authority Board. We have we've had two significant meetings. You know, even um, oh, who's at the City of Grand Rapids, the Water and Sewer Department, Postma. Uh, your engineer. What were the promise? What were you guys led to believe? Well, no, the whole effort of that discussion was to get water and sewer to that area, and what the cost and what the engineering should be. So, I mean, so these weren't like casual discussions. It took me a year and a half to two years to get all the, we not only got traction to talk to individual parties, we got traction to get all the parties at a conference room at the airport to have those discussions on a minimum of two occasions, if not three occasions, you know, including, I'd have to go back to my notes, but even your, your, your township engineer even had dug into it and started pulling uh, out. Up until recently, we, we haven't had a township engineer, but perhaps it was our what, contractor. Yeah, your contractor. Um, a quick question. And, when was the last meeting held? Just prior to COVID. So a couple of years ago? Yeah. yeah. All right. Because what, what I was told, and I want to affirm this while you're here, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. No, it was a great discussion. We yeah. had a lot of fun in the discussion. Well, what, what I mean, I was, we had a lot of involvement in yeah. it too. What I was told is that it was a back of the napkin math came to about 12 million to get the water and sewer. And at that time, uh, the developers asked Cascade to put up 10 to 11 of that. There was never a formal okay. discussion, never. That, we that, were just trying to find some common ground to get it to work. And even in today's world, there's lots of grant monies and other elements that can help bring that up. I mean, the bill that our governor just signed two weeks ago, yeah. you know, that's probably got all the money right there for water and sewer infrastructure. Okay. You know, because they're, I mean, they're desperate to bring shovel ready sites. Um, what I started to say is on the Seaboard board, we have a person from MEDC on our board. And she made an interesting comment that just sparked me. She said, we are getting calls, and this wouldn't be for Cascade Township, but we're even getting calls for large acreage parcel because you're seeing the reshoring, you know, a lot of manufacturers speaking over here of just getting this stuff back out of China to, to get up stable supply chain so this is happening all over this isn't like new this is like m massive momentum okay and so this th these are like greg said very hard you know boundaries around this that's why it's so ideally suited even the planning you know so that fedex can go in there was to make a class a road going down to 60th street so that so not only was it a discussion but infrastructure started to be built in that direction so no thank you thank you so much oh you bet sorry yes in those meetings with the airport and then the former engineers and people in the project, there's an airport access study that is also being pushed out. Has it, did that come up at all? I'll a little finish. bit. Even to the point I got asked, the airport put together an advisory board of realtors trying to get their feedback. And so we sat on that for a little while. It's I interesting because mean, you would think that they would communicate with the township that all this is going to happen. In. And my conversations with our manager were that, look, to develop, they got to get sewer water, and that hasn't happened. 
Yeah, but we were, I mean, the, just the discussion, we know where the sewer and water sits at the end of 52nd Street and up at 36th Street. So that would, and the ideal way is to get a loop. So everybody was really embracing, because there's going to be a longer term investment need. And so that even for the residents on the PFAS issue was to get a loop through there. Well, we've so, been working on that, and that's not with any of the cooperation. So the yeah. township's on top of that. Yeah, but I mean, they were very involved. You know, the airport? Right? Or the, oh, the, air, the airport. The township, the airport, everybody was very involved in this discussion. There was no negative. There was never one element of a discussion of that going a different direction. It was always, it was the whole plan was <clears> to move in that direction. That's the reason we sort of really made the investment they had. And it wasn't just for my discussion. Greg had so, discussions and that, that carried up and picked up exactly where, from where we left off. So, no, very positive discussion. Thank you. The planning commission is included in those kinds of things. Yeah, it, it, if there are further discussions, we'd love to be included. I don't think so. It'd be nice um, if we were. Is is well, no, I mean, that's not our fault. Is there anybody? No, I, I, is there anybody present from the uh, Gerald R. Ford International Airport tonight? Let the minutes reflect that there's nobody present from the Gerald R. Ford International Airport. So, um, you, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, ask, Brian, did they get a letter? We did not send one out for this one because we were looking at the properties south of that. Okay. Manager yeah. Spacey received a phone call from this, I think it's COO. Okay, so they're aware, they're aware of, of that. So they're aware of, the, of this, but chose not to participate. I don't know, I just know that we hadn't heard of it, but we didn't call out the letter. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, do we have anything? Can yes. Work yes. Um, just as a point of information, you might not be aware, there was another property here on the south of 52nd Street that sold in the last year. Yeah. It was owned by the Oster Houses, and that sold to a development company again with the expectation that this is going to be industrial development. Got it. So and that's thank us. you for that. that would be well, that's you. Okay. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. This has been incredibly helpful. I'd like to thank everybody who participated. Again, this was uh, solely intended for us to get feedback uh, from uh, the owners uh, and, and residents around that area. And I think that we've accomplished that. Yes. Just for clarification, there's no one here east of Thorn Apple River Drive, correct? Everybody here is on the west side of Thorn Apple River Drive tonight. Okay. Just a quick note is the email that was read into the record. That property is actually east of the highway. I know. I okay. saw that. I saw that. All right. And there's nobody on Zoom still? Okay. Yeah. Does anybody, before I move on, uh, have anything else as it relates to this? I think uh, next steps are the, um, the, the subcommittee will meet, I think, on the 20th. We'll meet on probably on, I think we have a meeting on Thursday. So that's the 20th. Yeah. Well, well, then there you go. All day long. <laughs> We're both right. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. Subcommittee will meet on the 20th and review what we've uh, received tonight and uh, come back with some recommendations. Yes. Yeah, so you won't get those recommendations for a few meetings. No, that's, that's, Understood. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a slow moving drain, and yeah. we're we're uh, we're still kind of in the fact finding, and this is very helpful. But uh, this this will help us continue to unravel the uh, ball of knots that we have. Awesome. Thank you all uh, for coming. Super helpful. Uh, moving on to Article Eight, review the zoning of the hotel properties. I spent some time looking through these. Uh, one takeaway, Brian, was we are incredibly inconsistent with our PUTs. <laughs> um, but that is that is a huge opportunity for us to become a lot more consistent uh, with the same use in our PUDs. Um, I think you know the one that I I, I did like uh, was the Drury Inn, where you know there was some language where any member of uh, the township uh politically appointed or otherwise uh can make an appearance at any reasonable time or unreasonable time if it deemed necessary uh to inspect what was in the pud um i do think that in future hotels uh, again i'll open it up to everybody else we should probably put some language in about maximum stays and, and, and things like this but again how are we to know and you know some of them like 1983 it's where i saw your mom's name um you know 
like how, how are we to know at that time that this would become an issue? So, but uh, unfortunately, supervisor, I, we couldn't, there was nothing in those PUDs that are, I think gonna give you teeth, uh, was my perspective. Did anybody have a contrary view to that? I thought it was interesting. The, the jury was one of the newer ones that we approved. Yeah. Uh, but we also approved one behind Meyer and it did not appear to have that. No, uh, it didn't. Have that language. So it struck me, uh, it was a little odd that one would have it and the other wouldn't. And yet I believe the same author drafted both. So I, uh, I, well, I think if, tell me if I'm wrong, Brian, don't they submit the draft language for a PUD for us? Typically. So I've only done amendments so far that have been here, but I'll yeah. draft the amendment to the PUD and send it to the applicant to see if they have comments. Okay. Or so you, you'll take the, it's, so we're not iterating there. We're, we're actually drafting. That's it. how I've done it since I've been here. Again, I haven't actually written it. We haven't done a new one since I've been here, but doing okay. amendments, I'm the one that drafts that and then sends it to the applicant. Okay. Brian, so, one yeah. question. Does it, when we, if we had a brand new PUD from scratch, does council draft that or does staff draft that? I, how I would process it is probably I would draft it and send it to council to review and as well as the applicant. Okay. And as far as history to that one comment that was highlighted for inspection, is there any way to know if that was our thought or if council recommended that to us at that time? I could, I'd have to dig through that case and I doubt I'd I find think something. That was Steve. But specifically, uh, Ben, I remember Sperla talking about that. Uh, it came up on something else and, and he thought it, Sperla liked it, who was the chairman at the time of the, and so Steve, I don't know why Steve put it in there, but Steve put it in there. Okay. Yeah, I'm guessing something must have come up during it that most likely we would have added that. We, well, we traded them uh, where we let them group, uh, scale it higher for that mm -hmm. nice cascade sign that you see right in the general vicinity. <laughs> Like there was a, a quid pro quo that happened on that. Um, and so I think that's where some of that inspection well, it was. The, it was the parapet walls that made it higher, if I remember yeah. right, not the actual building. So I think the planning commission was willing to go along with that because if they didn't have the parapet walls, then you would see everything on the roof because it's not part of the building. The AC unit isn't no. necessarily. So so that was why we went along with that. But they also extra height. funded that nice... They did. They, they gave us that spot up front to put that sign. That There were some people that really wanted that sign there. But it wasn't necessarily a trade sign. I don't or, know. Oh, it was implicitly I, a... It might have been. Yeah. I, I know there was a, a lot of conversation for the out lot there, which has not been developed. I don't know if you realize that, but there's a, yeah. there's a tract of land there that they were trying to uh, it's be a restaurant. attract a certain type of restaurant. And they have failed to do that to date uh, but someday their goal is to have a, a, a restaurant there in that in that pad which is part of the pud so i when that happens it'll come back to us for a site plan on that but that there was a lot of conversation between that and the power easement and the sign the sign was like i said sign was a big deal it, it, the, gotta have that sign that former chairman ben um, brought it up as an example many times Okay. Uh, to those of us who were serving, I think mean, it was just Scott and I then. Um, so that's how I know it was, uh, you know, a quid pro quo. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, I Never think wrong. in the future, um, we should have something in there that says if the hotel changes hands, then they have to come back in for a review and that's our opportunity to change things. I think it's also interesting that they have the right to come to us and ask for a, a change in zoning, but we don't have the right to go back to them. I mean, five years from now, things can be totally different. I think we do. I, well, then we should. I, 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 Brian, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I, we, we have all the rights in the world to change zoning. I mean, certainly you have to follow certain rules. But... Right, yeah. You have to notice and obviously taking public comment. I look into that a little bit more before we go down that road, though. We have, you know, a township can rezone properties. You have to give notice, obviously, to property owners and things like that. Well, can so we make changes we, to the, I mean, like, yeah. Say, you know, yes. I guess hotel is not long term stay, long term stays. And things there's like that. a whole host of things that, that we, we can do. Uh, and that, that's why it's not implicitly, it doesn't need to be like okay. our, we have a right as a government to do that. Yes, Member Rissi. So if we can, so you're saying we can, I understand we can change zoning, but can we change the terms of a PUD? We'd probably double check that with legal counsel if you need yeah. any Especially kind of, when what it says kind it, of or if it, any approval from, 
property owner. Right, who, because it's a recorded document that both they and the township have signed that's right. recorded at yep. the county. So I would the, think that'd be a little bit yeah. more involved process. But what if the original signing of the POD is- Well, they may agree to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, what I'm saying is if saying. they sell it, mm -hmm. then we, we as a township did this POD with you and you sold it to Timmy. Well, guess what? We didn't do it with Timmy. We did it with you. And that's our recourse to go back. The PUD stays with the property. So the person buying it, it has to do their due diligence to know that they're, they're under those restrictions. Now, that being said, I, I, that would be a question for legal counsel, I guess, as to how, how much leeway we have with making changes. But I'd, I'd like to ask another question, if I may, yeah. Mr. Chairman. So I, I noticed there's several hotels that we did not have PUDs for. Uh, for instance, I'm just going to throw out, I'm not trying to pick sites here or anything, but I'm just going to throw one out. Uh, what is the zoning for, like, let's say the Red Roof Inn next to the jury? Because I don't think that's in a PUD, if no. I'm not mistaken. You've that's got just... that inventory table in your packet there, if you see that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm Madison that pulled that together first, but that's in the expressway service zoning district, I believe. Okay. And we didn't have, this is a great example, because we didn't have the expressway service zoning district probably at the time that that hotel was constructed. Probably not that one. Right. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. Right. But. So, I mean, that goes along with the conversation that we can change the zoning. We, we reference them all as hotels and motels. So I suspect we could easily uh, amend zoning specifically for hotels and motels. I, I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to give a person a haircut, right? And, and so when I look at this situation, there's a lot of different ways to to get to the goal. And I think that probably the best way right now, at least for starters, is to explore, I think what the board has already talked about with service fees related to excessive uh, calls from police and fire and whatnot to try to reclaim some of that. Uh, that certainly I think is an important first step, but there's no doubt that as a planning commission, I think we need to um, we need to do a better job of now that we've all become keenly aware of the problems that exist, we need to understand that as we draft further, you know, PUDs or amendments or any other requests for zoning. And if we decide to amend zoning, we definitely need to, to do what we can to a back up the board and B make things better because uh, yeah I, I just you know if had we known this when we were approving the Drury or the hotels by Meyer I think we would have had a whole different view of how to how to progress forward so that's why these conversations are really good. I, do we have any hotels coming up? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think I've ever even had any kind of calls or anything about a hotel. Are there any other thoughts? I, ha I have a couple. Yes. Okay. Uh, the first one is, I think some of these hotels, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, are Section 8 housing. Is that true? Really? Uh, yeah, I don't I think that doesn't can apply be. to, does it? Tell that would make it more of an apartment for, building, wouldn't yeah. it? Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that, that wasn't some, that there wasn't some kind of federal like law that would probably... Um, prevent us from making any changes. So but that's not to say that the hotel isn't renting to somebody who's getting Section 8 funding. Right. I'm just not telling you. So I, I didn't know if that was going to play you, into this conversation I, at all. I yeah. not I mean, Section 8 funding, though, is you have to have a defined address. Right. So it's not like you would get funding and apply it. Well, you, to have, to be, you have to be approved as a Section 8 uh, I don't know, housing facilitator. Of some sort. I mean, I don't think anybody, you know, I can't say, Ben, you, you can move in if you have yeah, section. If I just move into my house, I'll take your check. You know, it doesn't work like that. But even on the other side on the recipient, and I think it is only for a specific address. So I don't think it's a transient in nature. Like I have the funding and I can use it in this location now. So, there's, and, so people are I, not allowed to stay there with federal funding for a 
That's what I'm saying. I'm I don't know, but I, maybe they are using that as a permanent draft. Right, I they think that's the problem. <laughs> Red roof in is one, two, three, four, 28th Street. Um, you know, suite 102. That's my address. I believe that there's something that we can easily look up and verify if that's no, an address. Some of those hotels were pitched to the Planning Commission as a long term stay site. And when the owner was here in the room trying to get his approval, I remember he, he talked about room rates and bringing the rates up to keep the riffraff out and make sure that the long-term stays were exclusive to, you know, business transactions or whatever. His house burned down. They had to stay there for four weeks or whatever. It, it wasn't a, you know, they, they were trying to get away from the, from the short short term $12 you know, an hour. Yeah. I need a place to stay for a few hours or I need to, you know, stay here for a week because I don't have a house. Um, I, did, did you have other questions? I, just one other comment. Um, and I noticed this, not in all of the PUDs, but a handful of them. There's a paragraph. Um, I'm looking at, let's see the first, uh, it's the Drury PUD. Um, section 14, the township finds the project will not result in material increase in the need for public services, facilities, and utilities, mm -hmm. and will not place a material burden upon the subject property and the surrounding properties. Clearly, that's not happening. So I don't know if that is a paragraph that we can use. Why? Well, that's the thing. Was that in just the drawing? It's just the drawing. Because guess what? The drawing is not, the drawing is fantastic. Yeah, I don't think they're the issue. <laughs> I feel like when I read, I thought I saw it in a couple others. I'm not going to lie. I didn't read every one. I think that's one read. that that pops up in a few of them. It, yeah, I think to, it was in a handful of them. You know, if it was in the clear out under the red roof, really red roof, it wouldn't be because they didn't, they weren't a PUD. They didn't have a PUD. Oh, right. And the clarion is B2. Yeah, I don't think clarion had a PUD either. I don't think. No, they're just a so B2 a zoning. Best Western Country in. It's like Hampton, Holiday Inn. Yeah, Clarion's not a PUD. Could I get a list, Brian, please, of the hotel that, or the, that may have that language in it? Yeah, or we have this list of what ones are in the it's PUD, the and then. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, if you go online, it's in our packet. Thanks for really. But I think she's reading. looking for specifically pages. which language. <laughs> <laughs> really yeah, fun. I can have Madison take a look at this. That, that was it. Okay, Timmy. So like last month, we really have three hotels that are being a problem. And last month there were 96 emergency calls to one address. Jeez. And that was just for last month. And it's like that every month, every month, every month. And then there's two other ones that are over a hundred calls between the two of them. So we're over 200 calls a month to three addresses. And that's the problem. So our fire engines are getting worn out, running back and forth down the street for this stuff. They need to recoup the cost. So that's what we're trying to do is put this, put a stop to this nonsense. What would you estimate the cost being per call? 1,500, what would you estimate? I mean, I would bill 500 per call. Can you bill actual cost? I don't know if you can. Yeah, you can. It'd be a lot more than 500. Then you bill them for actual costs. Anything over a certain. But that's something that the board is taking up directly. So that's that's not something that we're looking at here. Well, as just residents, put, though, we should go to the yeah. board meetings and give them feedback. Just put we like feedback the here. Is. They do well, that. and that should be in future PUDs too. <laughs> and it certainly could. And that's why I asked if there were other ones because I think we need to come up with a template for hotels moving forward. Absolutely. And what better use than the next one that comes up? And and that can be kind of our guinea pig. Right? Uh, mem member Engel, any thoughts from you? No, I just echoing what somebody else said, you know, could with the change of ownership in the current hotels, could we amend? Is there any way to amend the PUDs to in, include, you know, capture language, for example, and a more specific um, responsibility for the runs? Uh, maybe there's not. I just don't know the answer to the question. One of the other things that we, we talked about, you talked about in the last meeting was the, I, I think, the fee. Uh, the uh, the room charges, and I wondered if anybody knew whether there was any precedent for building that into um, either a future PUD 
either in terms of minimum stay or minimum rates, if there's a precedent for that. And I, I simply don't know. I, I think there certainly should be limitations on the length of stays allowed. I mean, unless they're coming to us specifically as a hotel that is geared towards long-term stay, extended stay, but if that's not their, if that's not what they're going after, because um, I'd be open to conversation on that. But, but I, aside from that, I, I think there should be limitations. I mean, this, this, you know, you can stay for 28 days. I, that seems excessive to me. I don't know. I've traveled a lot, but I guess I, yeah. I don't Scott, like far. you said, you do just want to be aware of the people whose house burned down and if right. they have to stay at a hotel. It's just little things like that. We want to make sure we're aware of. And to but, Joe's point, you probably want you know that minimum stay stayed in. So right, it's not a four hour rate or something like that. Not that I know if any of them are doing that or not. But couldn't you could couldn't you tell the hotel that you know you're allowed to have so many. I'm going to call them a long-term stay. <laughs> um, you're allowed to have this many long-term stays, and then the rest of it is limited to, you know, 20 days or something, consecutive days. But, I mean, I would think you could, to, to facilitate those types of situations, and we don't have that many people in the community whose houses are burning down, I, I don't think. There's an easy way around that, though. I mean, if there's two people in the room, it's under your name for the first 20 days, and then my name for the second 20, and then yours for the next 20, and you just flip-flop back and forth. So, I mean, there's a way of, I mean, there's right. There's, anything we'll, we do, that have to be the enforcement aspect and not how we actually review yeah, and enforce that. I think, well, two things. One, do we have any data to suggest that the people of those 96 calls stayed more than 30 days? Is there a connection between the two? Good question. Yeah. And so that, that's first. Second, I worry about putting rules in place and not having any enforcement of the rules. So if, if we have a 28 day maximum stay, who's actually auditing? Are we asking them to submit books? I mean, if they're not following rules or maybe even best practice to uh, be welcoming of a population that would need those services, why do we suggest or think that they would follow our rules? It's, it's a potential tool, mechanism to enforce if it is a problem. Right. My, my point is that the recoupment of costs is probably a better vehicle and deterring factor to them. Do we have a way to find out if the 96 calls that happened this month were any of those um, individuals a repeat from the prior month at a different even at different location sure i mean there's got to be a way to dissect that data to see that oh hey look Absolutely. bob smith was a problem in march april may and june but at different addresses when the police are called to a call they take down everybody's name so right. we'll have that i mean it's not as easy as querying a database because a lot of it's probably just on but a I would, paper yeah. with them but i would think they could tell us if we're dealing with you know, yeah, you had a repeat of five individuals or you had a repeat of 45 individuals. Well, that would give us an idea of the scope of the problem. I, I think the best way to do it is kind of what Ben might be thinking is stop penalizing the people that are staying for 28 days and start penalizing the owner of the hotel, yeah. right? Because that's, you know, you start sending somebody a $10,000 penalty, they're going to clean up their act quick. And that's the, info. we don't have to enforce right. it, they enforce it. If they get caught, they pay the price. And the so, likelihood of the people that are causing the problem having any type of resource is no. pretty, pretty small. No. Right. I, so, I, I'm just trying to be cautious so that we don't, you know, bring a mallet to a situation where we need a scalpel. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's probably escalating tiers of response to this and changing zoning might not be the first Agreed. response. So the, the township board, as I understand it, will be looking at an assessment for emergency vehicles coming out. Yes. So perhaps we will wait for direction from you if that's not an effective, does, does everybody agree with that approach? Yeah. I yeah, there, a, I, should we have Brian sense. check with legal to see if there's any way that we can amend the current PUDs? Because it's associated with the property, I believe that it transfers yeah. with sale. That's how I understand property. a PUD. No, no, no. Let's just say same owner, PUD, uh, ownership doesn't stay the same, but we change. Did you change the term? That's that's the problem. It might have to be mutual. We have to talk to legal counsel okay, and find out. 
Brian, do you think this is a question to put into? Did we want that question now or did we want to see, like Chris, you were saying how this other That approach... question would be good for okay. more than just this. Can I'd like to know. Sure. Yeah. Right. PUD. Uh, with change of ownership or unilaterally. Yeah, just unilaterally. I think we've had a conversation what, what, with this though because there's been other PUDs um, where <laughs> if we could arbitrarily change a PUD, we would have done that. Some in different shapes. So right. I think, <laughs> can we do it unilaterally? And if the answer is yes, or, or, or maybe what, what conditions must be met for right. us to change it unilaterally? Mm -hmm. And if we can't do it unilaterally, when can we, is there any other time or way I think, we can do it? I think zoning is the answer to that, unfortunately. Right. Or you, or you build the ability to change into the PUD itself. Right, right? yes. Which is, yeah. which is future PUDs, yes. The township, um, so everyone, there's different pieces, different moving parts. I will say that the, the hotel, just a few, that, that all the recommendations from the sheriff's part stuff, they're, they're not making any changes, but they all, um, or the, those few, bad apples, um, the township had to spend considerable staff time and also um, attorney fees get those same owners that are that are through the problem um, all fought hard uh, their assessment to be reassessed lower to change their taxes to lower than they did with COVID, but their profits are inconsistent with the request. So. Yeah. Can I ask for one more piece of research? Uh, well, Remember, I go first. This is not a new problem to townships. Um, can we go to MTA or somebody else that, and ask a simple question, how's everybody else handling this? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people that are sitting on interstates with yeah. a lot of hotels. And rather than reinventing the wheel, maybe there's something simple that we could... Uh, I, I know that... I, we'll, real, real quick, sorry, remember wrapping No, that was my same question. I'm like, it, this is a systemic issue that can't just be a cascade issue. Sorry, go ahead. Matt. I know Lowell, the Lowell Area Fire Authority, I think, recently in the last year or two had a discussion about recapturing fees because of because they had so many emergency calls the same kind of a thing and i think there's a way to do the recapture without having to restructure a pud but i think if we're going to put more uh, more hurdles in there that's where we that's probably where where the uh where we'd run into some legal issues so there's something to think about is we give the person the choice you can either do the recapture fee which we don't need your approval to do or you can come in and we can agree to change the PUD and then you don't get dinged for the recapture. Maybe we'll use that as leverage. Yeah. Get them to the table. Where's, like where's the, the leverage if they don't have to change the PUD? They don't yeah. have to agree to change That's the PUD. That's fine, then we start recapturing the fee. I think you have to be universal. I don't even think you can say hotels. I think you have to, and, and Timmy kind of went through this at the township, like you have to be all or nothing when it comes to recapture, as right. I understand it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. But you give them a few. You but you, know, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. You give them a few. And yep. then anybody that's excessive is the problem. And that's and that's really the problem we're trying to solve. So it works out really well. All right. So two or three calls a month on yeah. the house after that. Yeah. You guys to pay to play. Pay to play. So all right. Then I think we, we have a, a way forward. Is everybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Okay. I'm moving on to Article 9, old business. Any old business? I have none given the time. I think that's pretty good. All right. Hearing none, uh, Article 10, any other business? All right. Hearing none. Uh, any? we have anybody out on Zoom? Do I hear a motion Chris, for Chris, I will just note that our next meeting is the 14th of November. So because of elections. So not the first Monday, but the second Monday. So. Oh, we don't have one. I thought we don't have one at the, all right. So the 14th, November, 14th of November. and 21st in November. The 21st. Yep. We always skip the election week. Yeah, I knew that. Um, let's see what we can do to consolidate if possible. Brian, I don't know what you have coming up. Sure. Just to the 14th, that 21st is not a fun week for a lot of people, so. Yeah, we'll take a look. Um, excellent. I uh, hear a motion for adjournment. We do. Support. All right. Member Engel makes a motion. Member Deering supports it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Have a good night. Mr. Chair. 15. Aye. It's not too bad. I hope you didn't just create a, 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 a stampede of people to come to our Thursday morning meeting. <laughs>